Okay, let's get started. Uh, so we're going to continue where we left off. If you remember, we talked about flash memory before the exam week. Uh, and we have the exams graded. I don't think we've announced them yet. I think most of you guys did pretty well. Uh, but we'll, we'll announce them later on. That's true, right? We haven't announced them yet. Okay, yeah. But it's all done. Uh, okay, so we will continue with flash memory. Uh, and we should put questions on flash memory on the next exam since attendance seems low. <laughs> Some hard questions. There are a lot of questions here in flash memory. It's an exciting topic. Okay, uh, so if you remember, we were talking about a lot of things in flash memory, and these are some readings that I would recommend. Uh, we may assign them later on. But we were in the middle of discussing flash memory error analysis and reliability, and there's a lot more to do in this area. Uh, and remember, we were discussing read reference voltage prediction. Some of the, actually, we were discussing a lot of techniques that are implemented in flash controllers today. Contrast this discussion with the DRAM discussions that we had earlier, right? DRAM controllers are really doing nothing compared to flash controllers, if you think about it, in terms of reliability, for sure. But these controllers are doing, basically everything that I'm going to discuss over here is pretty much implemented or is being implemented in flash controllers going forward. So a read reference voltage prediction is something that definitely exists today. Basically, remember, we develop models for threshold voltage distribution. Threshold voltage, is, the threshold voltage determines the value that's stored in a, a flash cell and you have a threshold voltage range, and you chop it up into smaller sub-ranges, each sub-range encodes a data value. Right? It could be in an MLC, multi-level cell NAND flash, it could be 00011011, right, two-bit flash. But there are flash memories that are three-level cells right now. It's called three-level cells, unfortunately, but it's really three bits encoded in a voltage range. It's really eight states. Uh, in a sense, it's eight levels, right? It's not three levels, but it's three bits. Uh, and people are looking into four, encoding four bits within the voltage range, right? So this threshold voltage distribution is important to understand because that, uh, the read reference voltages you pick uh, are critical for how many errors that you get when you're reading. Uh, and remember the voltage distribution. Basically, we wanted to mitigate the effects of program interference caused voltage shifts, but this is true for retention also, as we will see. So this is an example of uh, threshold voltage distribution. We, we actually covered these slides. Let's say you have these two different states, state A and state B, and this is the threshold voltage distribution of the cells that are programmed into these state A and state B. Uh, ideally, you would like to pick uh, this uh, uh, as your read reference voltage, uh, and that read reference voltage essentially crosses the distributions at, that, at the point where the distributions cross each other. And that's, this is the bit error rate you get. In that case, the cells that are over here are supposed to be in state B, but you read them as state A because that's the read reference voltage you pick. And the, the cells that are over here are supposed to be in state A, but you uh, attribute state B to them because they're, they have voltage that's higher than the read reference voltage over here. And this is your bit error rate as a result. It's the area underneath these distributions that are marked, uh, as you can see over here. So if you actually pick the wrong read reference voltage, meaning that, let's say, you pick this one as your uh, read reference voltage, V', v prime ref, then you get a higher bit error rate because the area becomes higher uh, in that case. So you don't want to pick these, this read reference voltage, which means that if the threshold volt if, if assuming that you started with this read reference voltage and the threshold voltage is somehow shifted to the left in this case, you, you want to be able to adapt to that shift. That's why it's important to predict that read reference voltage before the shift happens. So basically, there exists an optimal read reference voltage, uh, and it's predictable if the statistics of the threshold voltage distributions are characterized and modeled. So if at this point in time, the threshold voltage uh, distribution you know, and if, if, you, if you can predict that it's going to shift by this amount uh, after so many programming erase cycles, let's say, or after some number of effects, then you can actually adapt your read reference voltage to the threshold voltage distribution changes. And flash controls actually do this. Um, I'm going to give you a, uh, a couple of methods related to this. So basically, uh, this is what we would like to do. Right? Whenever the threshold voltage shifts to the right in this case, so after program interference, remember, when you have program interference, you're programming some cells. And the cells that are around it get affected because of that programming. 
So the threshold voltage, uh, voltage of those cells that are around shifts to the right. That's why this distribution is here, and this distribution shifts, shifts to the right after program interference. Which means that you, if, you, if you're able to model the voltages nicely, you would predict that shift from VREF3 to VREF3 prime. That's the idea. So how do you do that? You can learn. You, don't, you do this every 1,000 programming rate cycles, let's say. Of course, there are some thresholding that happens in existing flash controllers. You program some sample cells with known data pattern and test the threshold voltage. And you program some aggressor neighbor cells and test the victim threshold voltage after interference. And then you characterize a mean shift in the threshold voltage uh, distribution. This is called program interference noise. And your optimum redifference voltage prediction could be this, basically. You have the default redifference voltage plus the predicted mean shift by this model that you learn over time. And you can do this in the background, basically. Once in a while, you figure out what would be my shift. And you could actually do this in a finer granularity. You could say, uh, for, for these different uh, cells with different characteristics, I'm going to learn different functions or different models. That's perfectly possible, because some cells may have you don't want to do this necessarily, but there may be cases where you want to do this. Like some, uh, some, some, some blocks may have some number of programming array cycles, some other blocks may have some other number of programming array cycles, and you may go in different models for them. And that could happen, because especially if you're partitioning your hot data from the, your cold data inside a solid state drive, you will, you will run into this problem. And existing drives are actually increasingly going forward to partitioning hot data from cold data. We will see that at the very end of this lecture, actually. There are many reasons for it, some of the reasons I gave in the last lecture. Uh, but if you actually put hot data together, you, you don't need to refresh it, for example. That's another reason to do it. If all of the data that you, you keep touching uh, that data, you're, you're, you're writing to it a lot, then you don't need to refresh it much. So there are good reasons for partitioning hot data and cold data uh, separately from each other. And which means that if you do that partitioning, uh, the threshold voltage shifts will be different for those data with different characteristics. As a result, you need to learn the different models in a different way. OK, so this is one example from the paper that I mentioned. Uh, if you don't do read reference voltage prediction, your bit error rate, raw bit error rate before error correction is pretty high. If you do read reference voltage prediction as proposed in the paper, uh, whose mechanisms are really implemented in existing controllers, then you actually reduce the read reference, uh, you reduce the raw bit error rate significantly, as you can see. And this is independent of the uh, of how worn out your flash device is. Basically, this is good to do in general because your threshold voltages shift. And if you remember, uh, I've gone through this, but I'm, uh, I wanted to go th through this again because we're going to look at some even more sophisticated things. Basically, you have an acceptable bit error rate given that you've decided on an error correction code. Let's assume a 32 kilobit uh, BCH code. Your acceptable bit error rate is 2 times 10 to the minus 3. If you don't do read reference voltage prediction, you reach that at this, this many PE cycles, programming array cycles. But if you do read reference voltage prediction, now you, correct, you, you basically uh, reach, uh, the, uh, reach the uncorrectable bit error rate after much longer. Basically, you improve your lifetime 30%. This is interesting. Basically, this shows that your ECC gets you only so much. If you actually have other error correction mechanisms or error reduction mechanisms, in this case, redifference voltage prediction, you, you basically make more out of your ECC. Your ECC has some certain capability. How you use it depends on how many errors that you really expose, that you really require uh, to be corrected by the ECC error correction code mechanism. And this actually goes back to our discussion that we had before. If you can correct the errors in a much simpler way than, error, than using error correcting codes, you'd better do that, as you can see over here. That's what we're doing. With the read reference voltage prediction, we're really getting rid of some of the raw bit errors, which means that we're not punting those errors on error correction codes. As a result, we're using the error correction codes for errors that are not really corrected easily with read reference voltage prediction. Make sense? OK. So another point over here could be, OK, you want to have a constant lifetime, let's say three uh, this is 30,000 in this case, 30,000 programming error cycles, or I'll pick this location over here. You want to have that constant lifetime. You could actually keep that lifetime over here, do read reference voltage prediction, and have much less ECC in the system. So ECC that uh, satisfies a bit error rate that's smaller than 2 times 10 to the minus 3, let's say 1 times 10 to the minus 3, would be uh, much less complex. 
So there are multiple ways of using this, basically. You could reduce the amount of ECC by keeping the lifetime constant, as opposed to increasing the lifetime, keeping the ECC constant. OK, so you can play a lot of tricks, clearly. OK, we already discussed that. And this is the paper. Uh, some of these papers, or one of these papers, may be assigned at some point. OK, and we said that it's important to accurately, if for this to work really well, you want to really accurately model uh, your distributions. And I've gone, gone over this. This is becoming increasingly complex. As I've shown you last time, Gaussian-based models are not really working very well, especially with devices that have very small feature sizes. And th this is real data from a device that has uh, one x nanometer feature size. Uh, and you can see that, uh, so let's say at 20,000 programming erase cycles, you can see that this distribution pretty much spans the entire voltage range. So that's the difficulty of actually uh, uh, making flash work at very small scales. Because you have very small number of electrons, you cannot control them really well. As a result, this particular state, I think that's program state one, uh, starts spanning pretty much the entire uh, uh, voltage range. It, didn't, it doesn't start out that way. It's not that good to begin with even, but it doesn't span the entire voltage range. But once you, uh, this is at 2.5k uh, programming array cycles, once you're at 20k programming array cycles, it looks like this. Now, if you have a Gaussian model, Gaussian model is not good at adapting to this sort of uh, discontinuities, if you will, or multiple peaks uh, in, in the distribution. As a result, you will not get this part of this distribution correct. In fact, you're not getting that correct in many cases over here. That's true for some of the other ones, but the blue one is the most severe one in terms of uh, the inaccuracy in the distribution. So Gaussian-based models don't well, no, uh, work well, so this paper proposed a simple model, students' T-based model. It's easy to compute online also. That basically tracks uh, this much, much nicely, as you can see. There's still some, uh, not imperfections, but it's, still, it's, it's quite good. These dashed lines are uh, the model, uh, the, uh, the, the triangles, I think. Those look like triangles. Yeah, triangles are actually what's measured. Make sense? So it's beautiful, actually. If you're designing flash controller, you would, you would know these distributions really well. <laughs> OK, so this is an example of the error rates. So with the Gaussian, actually, you have a, it's not terrible, but 2.6% is not, uh, is still high compared to uh, the student's T distribution. And there's also normal Laplace, the paper discusses. The downside is this is much harder to compute. So its error rate is low, uh, but it's much harder to compute. So this is, uh, this is the latency that you need for online computation of the distribution. So it turns out Laplace, uh, normal Laplace is much worse. But you can read the paper for more detail. Gaussian is easiest, but it doesn't give you a very good error rate. So student's T is uh, a good compromise between computation latency of the distribution online during online operation and the error rate that you get uh, in the end. Okay. Uh, okay, and this is actually, if you, if you do the prediction versus reality with better modeling, meaning you don't know the distribution uh, at 20k programming array cycles, but assume that you've collected data uh, during this, uh, during operation at 10k programming array cycles and every 2.5k intervals, then you can have a build a model using this information to predict the distribution at 20k PE cycles, right? With mechanisms that the paper discusses, but you can also imagine what those are. If, and this shows the uh, prediction. This is the predicted distribution, the, the dashed ones. And uh, the, blue, uh, the, the triangles are actually the measured values at 20k. Uh, you see that this tracks reasonably well. OK, and uh, basically, if you actually look at the actual and modeled optimal read reference voltages, modeled means, again, based on the prediction uh, that you do, you predict the read reference voltage, uh, the, opt uh, the, uh, the optimal read reference voltage at 20k based on data that's available to you during these uh, programming array cycles. And you look at how does that compare to uh, the actual optimal, because you can measure the optimal, uh, actual at the end when you know the values. So the actual is actually the blue one over here. And the, uh, the triangles are the student's T. So the triangles are actually not so bad compared to the actual. Actually, Gauss Gaussian is pretty bad, as you can see over here. So actually, you, you can predict your read reference voltages. This is a VA, VB, VC that are separating the three, uh, four different states uh, relatively well. So what is the effect on the robot error rate? Basically, you can see that. Uh, in, in some pages, so some pages are not affected as much. You can, you can read the reasons for it in the paper. But some pages are affected a lot. 
So in this case, for example, Gaussian gives you a much higher robot error rate, whereas student's t-distribution based modeling gives you a much lower robot error rate. So to gain this much reduction in error rate, we do all of that work to model the distributions. But that enables a much longer lifetime, as you can see, right? So if, you're, um, if, you, if your ECC is not able to correct um, over here, uh, if its correction capability is over here, for example, you would reach that correction capability much later in lifetime if you're doing the distribution modeling uh, in a much better way, much more accurate way. Make sense? So I gave you a lot of state-of-the-art research very quickly. <laughs> okay, and this is uh, the paper that actually looks at uh, that. It says to appear, but it's already appeared clearly in 2016. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this is one application of threshold voltage modeling. Uh, and uh, these are really, really interesting applications, actually. But what, ca what else can we do further? Any questions so far? Now we're going to look at really, really, in my opinion, very exciting techniques. This is, this is a technique that we developed there in around 2013. As I mentioned, when we first started looking into this research, industry was ahead of us. But once we understood things, this is the first technique that uh, perhaps uh, is really new that got into the products relatively quickly. Uh, and, uh, and our goal was uh, this, basically. We wanted to develop a better error correction mechanism for cases where error correcting codes fail to correct the page. You failed, error correcting codes uh, basically say, I have an uncorrectable error, what do you do? Can you be more intelligent at this point? So let's take a look at some of our observations. Uh, we're going to utilize the observations that we've seen so far. Basically, the immediate neighbor cell has the most effect on the victim cell when it's programmed. We saw this, right? When you actually program a neighbor cell, the immediate neighbor actually has a huge effect. The, the, the neighbor that's, uh, that's above you. And uh, we use a single set of redeference voltages to determine the value of the victim cell when we actually read it. Uh, and the set of redeference voltages is determined based on the overall threshold voltage distribution of all cells in flash memory. Basically, have an, you, all of the methods that we just discussed build an overall threshold voltage distribution. Overall meaning this is the threshold voltage distribution uh, of all cells belonging to this state, or that I think was programmed to this state. Right? And you have four states, as you know. So keep that overall in mind. So basically, uh, if you make that distribution conditional on the adjacent cell's value, you can, see, you, can, uh, you can see that that distribution is very different now. So basically, uh, the threshold voltage distribution of cells with different value, the immediate neighbor cells are significantly different. Because neighbor value affects the amount of threshold voltage shift that you have. So I'll, I'll show you an example of this. Corollary is that if we know the value of the immediate neighbor cell, of a cell we are trying to read, then we can find a much more accurate set of redeference voltages based on the conditional thre threshold voltage distribution. Conditional meaning conditional based on the value of the neighbor cell. That's the idea. So let's take a look at an example. Uh, so this is, uh, this is our victim word line, let's say, and this is the aggressor word line. And we're going to, at some point, read this victim word line, try to understand what's the data that we programmed into it. Uh, this is before the uh, last page of the aggressor word line uh, is programmed. Let's assume that you program this to the aggressor word line, the distribution shifts because you actually program stuff over here, you're affecting the distributions over here. And I'm exaggerating things, of course, over here, right? If you assume a single threshold voltage distribution, regardless of the value of the neighbor, this is what you would get. And you would pick a redeference voltage, hopefully, if your prediction is right, right in the middle. Now, if you knew more, what if your neighbor was 1-1? One, one? Then these distributions look very different. So if you actually say, if you actually look at all of the threshold voltages of the cells whose neighbors are 1-1, one, one, immediately above neighbors are 1-1, one, one, the distribution looks like this. Make sense? Which means that your threshold voltage is, if you, if, you, if you actually want to just read those cells, you can pick a threshold voltage that's over here, not over here. Okay, let's take a look at 0, zero. If you want to... Uh, look at uh, this is the threshold voltage distributions of all cells that are programmed to uh, whose neighbors are programmed to zero zero. And if the cell itself is programmed to state pi plus one, it looks like this. Pi looks like this. Again, this is the distribution for all cells whose neighbors are one zero. The distribution of all cells whose neighbors are zero one. And this is the conditional distributions. And if you combine them, then you will get 
these big distributions. Meaning that if you actually know your neighbor value, you could use some redreference voltage that's much better, that would give you uh, a much lower uh, error rate. And that's the key idea over here. If you knew the immediate neighbor, then you could choose a different redreference voltage to more accurately read the victim cell that you're trying to read. So this is called conditional reading, conditional on the value of your neighbor, as opposed to using the overall distribution. You don't use this overall distribution. If you use the overall distribution, you use this read reference voltage. But if you knew your neighbor was, uh, value was 1, 1, you use this read reference voltage. If you knew your neighbor was 0, 0, you would use this read reference voltage. And if you knew your neighbor was 1, 0, you would use this one. If you knew your neighbor was 0, 1, you would use this one. Yes? Mm -hmm. Basically, only the immediate last value. Is, that's why this works, actually. Only the last one that you write uh, to the top matters. <laughs> that makes sense, right? OK. OK, basically, uh, using the optimum read reference voltage based on the overall distribution leads to more errors. Better to use the optimum read reference voltage based on the conditional distribution, i.e., the value of the neighbor. Because the conditional distributions of the two states are far, farther apart from each other than the overall distribution. And OK, we verified this with real data. So this is uh, re measurements results from some real chip. These are the overall distributions, as you can see over here. They look like this, although in this case, it's actually nice. It's not terrible. But you can see the distances uh, that you have uh, between the different states. Uh, and the variance is uh, relatively high. Uh, OK, anyway, don't worry about that. Basically, you have a small margin over here. But if you do the conditional distributions, this is uh, the distribution of all the uh, voltage distribution of all the cells whose neighbors are, let's see, 0, 0, you see a much larger margin, right? This is basically what I showed you earlier, uh, cartoonishly, the real data from the real chips. So basically, uh, if you use the overall distribution, this is the bit error rate you would get. If you use uh, the conditional distributions, knowing your neighbor value, your bit error rate is an order of magnitude lower based on the real data from real chips. And that's the idea over here. So the, that's the idea that's called neighbor-assisted correction. It's called correction because you don't do this all the time. If you do this all the time, it's not good because you need to read uh, a page multiple times because the neighboring page have, has many values. Uh, so you would need to do it they read multiple times. So you first start, you read a page with the read reference voltage based on the overall distribution, same as today, and buffer it. And if ECC fails, then you take action. Because if ECC fails today, you don't do anything, your drive is dead. If ECC fails, now you read the immediate neighbor page. And once you know the immediate neighbor page, you know the values in the immediate neighbor page, hopefully at least somewhat correctly. ECC might fail over there also, which leads to a recursive problem, actually. But that's OK. Assume that ECC doesn't fail over there. Uh, then you reread the page that you were trying to read using the read reference voltages corresponding to the voltage distribution, assuming a particular immediate va neighbor value. Let's say you pick 1, 1. And you replace the buffered values of the cells with that particular immediate neighbor cell value, basically after this reading. So basically, you just, uh, uh, you just uh, read, reread the cells that have an immediate neighbor value 1, 1, and then you basically replace them in the first read that you had. Hopefully, you got the read correct. You apply ECC again. If the ECC doesn't fail, that's good. You basically uh, corrected those cells whose neighbors were 1, 1. Now, if the ECC fails again, what do you do? You go back, you reread the page, and then you assume some other neighbor value, let's say 0, 0. And then you replace them, and then you apply ECC again. Now you can actually correct. Basically, you do this four times in the worst case to cover all of the neighbor values, and eventually, you may be able to correct, or ECC fails, which means that you don't have any option at that point. Your drive is dead. So basically, it's, a, it's an iterative uh, mechanism. You read the page first. If ECC is correct, that's good. If ECC is not correct, then you start the neighbor-assisted correction process, which is over here. You read the LSB and MSB neighbors, and then you reread the page again uh, uh, with, the, with the read reference voltages, assuming a particular neighbor value. You correct the page. If ECC is correct, then that's great. Uh, you send the data out. If ECC is not correct, then you try this neighbor-assisted correction again with a different neighbor value. 
And if, they, if no uh, neighbor values are left to try, then you give an error. And if your ACC is not, is not able to correct anymore. That's the idea over here. OK, we already said this, basically. We read the neighbor values and use corresponding reference voltage in a prioritized order until ECC passes, or if, it, if everything fails. OK, there's, of course, questions over here, like how do you select the next local optimum read reference voltage? Uh, yeah, and you, you need to have that somewhere uh, recorded. Uh, you need to learn that also. Uh, but I'm not going to go into the details. The paper has all of these details. OK, so what is the benefit that you get? This is a bit harder to read over here, unfortunately. But if you don't do neighbor-assisted correction, this is your robot error rate curve, the red one over here. If you do neighbor-assisted correction with, uh, and this is programming array cycles as usual, uh, if, you do, if you just fix one value, which is 1, 1, uh, you basically get significant reduction. And if you keep fixing more, you get more reduction in error rate. So let's assume, again, that your ECC is capable of doing this. This is. Uh, achieving a one, uh, correcting a robot error rate of 1 times 10 to the minus 3. And you could achieve that by having an ECC uh, error correction code bits, uh, 40 bits per 1, ki one kilobyte blocks. Um, so uh, there, there's a period of your lifetime where you don't do neighbor-assisted correction. And after some point, your ECC starts failing. And there's a period of lifetime where you do neighbor-assisted correction by fixing just one uh, immediate neighbor-based values. And, and there's another period where you do more, neighbor, more sophisticated neighbor assist correction, another period where you do even more sophisticated neighbor assist correction. So you can see that with the first stage, if you do uh, the simplest neighbor assist correction, you get about 22% lifetime improvement. Now, if you want to do more, you get even more uh, uh, lifetime improvement. So it's about 39%. Of course, this comes at the expense of latency, right? Because you read the page again. So it turns out uh, you get pretty much no performance loss if you do uh, uh, go up to here. Well, there is some performance loss. To, it's in the paper, but it's within 1% or so. So if, you, so if you start going into this part of the lifetime, then your performance loss increases. And you can see that there's some analysis in the paper, but I'm not going to go into this in detail because it has some other assumptions over here. OK, make sense? And that's the idea over here. And this is actually, this is implemented as a state of the art in many uh, solid state drives uh, today. And even 3D, uh, 3D flash memories are implementing things like this going forward. OK, so I've given you some really interesting stuff. So if you actually know, if you understand your device, you can do a lot more, as you can see. And this is a, as you can see, this is a very intelligent memory controller, right? This is really, it has a lot of intelligence in how it really treats how, uh, the reading. If you did this, if there's something like this in DRAM, that would be very good. <laughs> of course, we don't know how to do this in DRAM yet. OK, so let's talk about some other areas in flash memory. We talked about draw hammer uh, in DRAM. But as I, as I said earlier, this, this type of error exists in flash memory or any type of memory. So we're going to look at read disturb in flash memory. Uh, and as I said, all scaled memories are prone to read disturb errors, DRAM, SRAM, hard disks. And we're going to look at it within the context of NAND flash. And I've already given you uh, this picture before, but basically, uh, very quickly, whenever you want to read uh, a page, you apply a very high pass-through voltage to all of the other pages in NAND flash. And I'm going to go through this quickly, because you know that. And we already know this as well, right? Basically, you encode data with threshold voltage value, and you distinguish between a 1 and 0 depending, by applying that threshold voltage, uh, uh, or read reference voltage. So if your read reference voltage is higher than the threshold voltage, you pass the value. If your read reference voltage is lower uh, than the threshold voltage, you, the transistor turns off. You basically inhibit the value. That's how you distinguish between a 1 and 0. OK. And pass through is basically if you apply a pass, uh, uh, you know, if you want the cells not to affect what's being read uh, from the top, you apply a pass through voltage, which is higher than any of the read reference voltages, right? which is really higher than actually any of the program threshold voltage values, not just read reference voltages. Uh, so in this case, 5 volts, let's say. So it's a very high voltage. So this enables reading, that pass-through voltage. So let's take a look at that. So if you want to read the values in page 2 over here, you want to apply the read reference voltage over here. Let's assume that you store one bit. Uh, and you pass through all of the other pages, meaning that you apply the pass-through voltage to all of the other pages. Now, what does this do? If you apply 5 volts over here, all of these pass through. 
So that's why they're agreed. If you apply the read reference voltage over here, the values, uh, the, the transistors that have re, uh, threshold voltages greater than the read reference voltage are inhibited. And other transistors that have threshold voltage values that are less than the read, uh, uh, less than the read reference voltage pass through. As a result, you get this, and this leads to 0011, which is exactly what you want to read from that page. Make sense? OK. Now, the read disturb problem happens when you repeatedly read from some page or any other page than page X, and the, uh, and the values on page X are disturbed because of that reading. Why does this happen? Basically, uh, let's assume that you're reading from page 3. Uh, you apply the pass-through voltage to all of the other pages. And let's assume that you keep reading from page 3, you apply pass-through voltage to everything else, um, meaning that this, this application of the pass-through voltage has a weak programming effect, meaning that it shifts the threshold voltage of some vulnerable cells a little bit. So this was the initial values that we have over here. And after doing this read-disturb many, many times, the threshold voltage happens to shift to 2.6 volts. Very little, but it does shift. Now, if this shifts to 2.6 volts, let's assume that you want to read from page 2 now. Now, if you read, that's not good because you get an incorrect value over here because this value changed because of the read disturb that happened to it. And in this case, the read disturb problem actually is worse because you're affected by not just your immediate neighbor, you're affected by anything that's read in this particular block, right? any page that's read. Because whenever you're reading, a particular page, you're applying a very high pass-through voltage to all of the other pages in the block. That's how the, uh, it works. That's how it's different from the Rohheimer effect in DRAM. It's a different mechan error mechanism. OK, so here now we have a problem. We have incorrect values in page 2. This is the incorrect value. And if your ECC cannot correct it, then you have a problem. Your drive fails earlier. So basically, let's talk about how to fix this problem. Uh, so it's actually uh, read disturb errors limit flash memory lifetime after you correct for other errors, like refresh. If you do all of the right things in your threshold voltage distributions, try to pick the optimum read reference voltage, uh, get rid of the retention errors as much as possible with intelligent refresh, read disturb errors become the next problem. Uh, and they limit your lifetime uh, because you apply a high uh, pass through voltage, as we said. OK, we said this already. So uh, this work actually characterized the read-disturb on real NAND flash chips. And there are two ideas here. One is uh, one of the observations that you, if you slightly lower this pass-through voltage, you greatly reduce the read-disturb errors. So if you can get away without applying this very high pass-through voltage, you can reduce the read-disturb errors. And also, some flash cells are more prone to read-disturb. Some flash cells are less prone. If you can identify the cells that are more prone versus less prone, you can do much better error correction or error recovery if your ECC fails. So we're going to look at two techniques. One is mitigating the read-disturb errors online by tuning the pass-through voltage. So we were, we were tuning the read-reference voltages. Now we're going to tune the uh, V-pass and dynamically find and apply a lower V-pass per block on a per block basis. And you can improve flash lifetime by 21% if you do that. So everything helps, actually. But if you keep adding these 21% everywhere, you get to a much longer lifetime. And the second technique is actually recovering after failure to prevent data loss. Uh, it's similar to neighbor assisted error correction, but it's, it's actually much more heavyweight than neighbor assisted error correction. Basically, you selectively correct cells that are more susceptible to read disturb errors after your ECC fails by doing some probabilistic analysis of which cells are more prone to these read disturb errors and which cells are less prone. So we'll see this. This is actually really interesting. There's a lot of probability that goes into flash drives uh, today. And I'm not even go talk, going to talk about the uh, low density parity check codes, which do some soft decoding that's very probabilistic uh, to begin with. OK. So this also reduced your orbit error rate significantly. So OK, let's take a look at this. This is uh, an example. This is actually, again, real data from real devices. This is your read disturb count on a block. And this is a measured orbit error rate. And this is what happens if you apply different pass-through voltages. And let's assume that this is the tolerable robot error rate over here. So if you apply the 100% uh, pass-through voltage that's applied today, which is basically the highest level, 5 volts, let's say, uh, your robot error rate looks like this. You reach the, uh, 
you reach uh, the uncorrectable bit error rate very quickly. In other words, your tolerable read disturb count is very low if you pick this pass through voltage and if you pick this ECC. Right? You basically have a tolerable read disturb count that's less than 10 to the 5, less than 10,000 read disturbs. Now, if you actually lower the pass through voltage a little bit, you start the curve. Uh, the curve starts shifting right, as you can see. If you lower it to 94%, the curve is over here, which means that your tolerable read disturb count is much higher. It's about 10 to, more than 10 to the 7. Right. So that's the idea. If you can use a much lower, actually much lower, 6% lower pass through voltage, you can actually reduce your orbit error rate significantly. Uh, and you, you, or you can have much more read disturb count. Uh, that you can tolerate. And that's the idea over here. So this is another way of looking at the curve that I just showed you over here. Uh, this is the percentage of reduction in uh, the pass-through voltage, and this is a normalized tolerable read disturb count. So it goes to 1300x over here uh, if you reduce it by 6%. Of course, if you keep reducing it, it's an exponential curve. It increases. But this is not a bad tolerable read disturb count. 10 to the 8 uh, is you read from the same block let's say, 10 to the 8 times. That's not bad, right? <laughs> it's actually much higher than uh, today's uh, row hammer counts. Today, you can induce row hammer in DRAM uh, after 20,000 activates or so, depending on, of course, your DRAM. We don't want to be here, clearly, because this is not so good, but 10 to the 8 is not bad. OK, so the first observation is that slightly lowering the pass greatly reduces read disturb errors. Uh, so how do you actually take advantage of it? So the idea is very simple. Once you know this, you tune the V-pass. You dynamically find and apply a lowered uh, V-pass. Uh, of course, there are advantages and disadvantages to it. Uh, you allow more read disturbs if you lower the V-pass. But you can induce more read errors, right? If you lower the V-pass too much, uh, to, let's say you lower it to 4.94. And some cell has a threshold voltage 4.95. Now you get a read error on that cell. So you want to be careful. Uh, okay, well, I guess this shows what I'm just going to say. Let's, let's assume you reduce the V-pass to 4.9 volts over here. This is good in this case, right? There's no problem. But if you reduce it to 4.7 volts, you have a problem over here. This cell is incorrectly read because it has a threshold voltage that's 4.8 volts. And if your ECC is not able to correct this, then you have a problem. But we're going to take advantage of uh, the unused ECC capability, uh, as we call it, uh, to be able to do this. Because actually these, uh, these high voltages are not good for many reasons. You want to actually reduce the high voltage as much as possible in a system. And uh, what I'm going to show you is going to have benefit beyond just tolerating read disturbs, but reducing the high voltages uh, is useful. So OK, so what does this unused ECC capability mean? So you have an ECC limit. Uh, Basically, and your ECC can tolerate some robot error rates. And you set your ECC to be able to tolerate that robot error rate. But it's really over-provisioned. Uh, your ECC correction capability is not always used. There's some unused ECC capability, especially uh, when you have uh, a retention age that's low. You program the cell, and it hasn't retained data for years yet. It's retained data. You programmed it, let's say, two hours ago. At that point, your ECC is over-provisioned for that particular block let's say, because there is not enough age in that particular block. Which means that you have unused ECC capability that's higher over here, that gets lower as the block stays in the flash drive for longer. And you can use that unused ECC capability to fix other errors that you may have. And in this case, we're going to induce more read errors to reduce the voltages. And we're going to fix those read errors by using this unused ECC capability. So actually, this is actually really interesting because this is a very general mechanism. If you have some unused capability in ECC, you can use it for inducing more errors to get rid of some of the other errors. And that's the idea, basically. And as, we, as I said, I use ECC capability to decrease over retention age over here. So we want to dynamically adjust VPASS so that read errors fully utilize the until unused ECC capability. And we get rid of as uh, we want to redu uh, we reduce voltage as much as possible. So basically, as opposed to today's uh, systems where you conservatively set VPASS to a high voltage, uh, you get no read errors, but you accumulate more read disturbers at the end of each refresh interval, plus you have very high voltages 
to operate, which affects your energy consumption too. We want to dynamically adjust VPass to unused ECC capability. We're going to minimize the read disturb errors, and we're going to control the read errors to be tolerable by the error correction code capabilities. If the read errors start exceeding the capability of the error correction codes, then we start increasing the pass-through voltage we pass to correct the read errors. That's the idea. Uh, so you can do this in multiple ways. This is one example implementation. You perform once for each block every day. Let's say you estimate the unused ECC capability because you know when blocks are programmed. Flash controllers can have a lot of information. Uh, you aggressively reduce VPass until read errors exceed uh, ECC capability. And if uh, you gradually increase VPass until the read error becomes just less than ECC capability if you start getting errors. So that's the idea over here. You basically tune the VPass. And you do this once every day. And we evaluate this. You basically assume a seven-day refresh period. This works much better, of course, if you refresh your flash, right? If you don't refresh your flash for three years, then your unused ECC capability is very low. And that's one other reason for refreshing your flash once in a while that actually gets you better uh, uh, use out of your ECC in the end. So not refreshing the flash is actually not a good solution because now your ECC is your... Uh, your ECC capability becomes much worse because your ret retention errors accumulate, and ECC is correcting those retention errors. Refresh is a much easier mechanism to correct for retention errors. You don't want to use costly ECC to correct for errors that you can otherwise correct with simpler mechanisms like refresh. And every seven-day refresh is not bad, assuming you're powered up, of course, right? Maybe every 14 days is, not, is, even, is even better. If you remember uh, last lecture, if you go to every day, now your overheads become increasing. But if you're every seven days, refresh is not bad. OK, so if this is the overhead that you get. If you tune it every day, uh, you basically need to spend about 24 seconds to do this VPass tuning for your drive, which may not be bad, because there are cases where your drive is idle for 24 seconds, probably. That's true even for data centers. OK, and there's some storage overhead, of course, to keep track of. Uh, setting uh, the VPass, and you can read the paper for that. So what is the benefit of this? So uh, basically, the takeaway is average lifetime improvement is significant. It's about 20%, but it's very uh, skewed. It's skewed in the sense that some benchmarks, some workloads actually over here, for example, for whatever reason, uh, some of these are web servers actually, uh, they, they do a lot more read disturbs. They read a page. They, essentially, they do more hammering of a particular page for whatever reason. Some other workloads don't have that effect. As a result, you don't see significant improvements. But in these workloads, you see significant improvements in terms of lifetime. OK, any questions? Am I going too fast? Sounds good. OK, people are. OK, you're learning a lot of really interesting techniques. I think this is, this is really exciting, actually. And these techniques, I think, uh, you can only find in the papers that I mentioned. You know, they don't exist anywhere else, or if you go and work uh, and build your own flash controllers. Okay, so let's take a look, look at another uh, approach to correct these uh, read disturb uh, errors. And we're going to take advantage of uh, the fact that some cells are more resistant and some cells are more prone to read disturb. And we're going to develop an error recovery mechanism. And this error recovery mechanism will likely be an offline error recovery mechanism. It's because it's too uh, much overhead to do this online during operation, as you will see. But offline error recovery mechanism is also very important, because if your drive fails, you want to be able to get the, all, every bit out of there uh, after your drive fails. OK, so basically, the uh, observation is that some cells are read disturb resistant, some cells are read disturb prone. After applying the same number of read disturbs, uh, disturb resistant cells, threshold voltage doesn't shift that much, whereas if a cell is disturb prone, its threshold voltage shifts a lot. So can we take advantage of it? So which means that if you look at the threshold voltage distributions uh, of, let's say, these two states, we can pick any state, some cells, uh, there, there's a heterogeneous uh, set of cells in each of the distributions. Some cells here are read disturb uh, resistant. Some cells are prone. Here, here, also here, some cells are read disturb resistant. Some cells are prone. Now, if you apply many read disturbs, let's say 250,000, this is what happens to the cells. The prone cells shift a lot, and the resistant cells, let's assume they stay where they are. And your threshold voltage distribution looks like this after that. 
Now we have a problem, right? Because now the threshold voltage distributions overlap, and you have these cells that are mixed. This was initially in uh, this resistance cell was initially in P1 state. It stayed there. This uh, cell was initially uh, let's assume this one. This cell was initially in the ER state, but it moved. Now they're close to each other. How do you disentangle them? Because this really belongs to state ER, and this belongs to state P1. But the observations that disturb prone cells have higher threshold voltages, so you can actually make use of this a little bit. And disturb resistance cells have lower threshold voltages. You can actually make use of that also. So the problem happens here, basically. Whenever you do a read reference voltage uh, over here, now you incorrectly read some of the cells. These are the disturbed prone cells. They should really belong to the ER state. And these are the disturbed resistance cells. They should really belong to uh, the P1 state. But here, if you look over here, you read some of them incorrectly. OK, that's not happening. I don't know why it's not happening. My computer become, became, OK, Microsoft wants to auto-update things. That's why it's not happening. <laughs> OK, so basically, uh, we misread these two cells in this case. And, but we don't want to misread those two cells. So how, so how can we do that? The, the idea is uh, taking advantage of the proneness, we disturb proneness of these cells to do error recovery. Let's assume you get an uncorrectable flash error. You back up all valid data in the faulty block. You disturb the faulty page, let's say, some number of times, enough times, or many more times than 100K. And then you compare the threshold voltages before and after we disturb. Right. And then you select some cells that are susceptible to flash errors. Basically, these are the cells that are around this vicinity. Right. So, OK. Basically, these are the cells that are around this vicinity. If you can somehow classify them as read disturb prone versus read disturb resistant, then you would actually find you would actually say, "Oh, this one is read disturb prone, so I should really uh, sorry, this one is read disturb prone, so it should really belong to the previous state over here. It moved over here because it was read disturb prone, and this one is read disturb resistance, so it should really belong to the higher state." That's the idea over here. If we can somehow probabilistically classify these cells, then we can actually switch uh, the reading that we did and say, OK, I have more information, so I, I, I declare this to be in the P1 state, actually, because I know that it's dis the read disturb resistant. Sorry. I declare this to be in the ER state because I know that it's read disturb prone, and I declare this to be in the P P1 state because I know that it's read disturb resistant. That's exactly what we're trying to do. We basically try to figure out what is read disturb prone and what is read disturb resistant. And we select those susceptible cells that are likely to be misread. And you predict among those susceptible cells if the cells that have had more uh, threshold voltage shifts, they're read disturb prone, which means that they should really belong to the lower VTH state to begin with. OK, there's something wrong here. Cells with more threshold voltage shifts are not read disturb prone, right? They are read disturb prone, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. That's, not, that's incorrect. Okay, okay. This always gets me <laughs> messed up. <laughs> because once actually there was something incorrect in the slide and I corrected it. But I'm not sure if this was the corrected slide or not. So, okay. So, so basically, you disturb the phage many, many times and you figured out okay, these cells are read disturb prone. Now, those cells that you're focusing on, uh, this one's read disturb prone. And these are the susceptible cells. You say that, oh, I misread this. It actually belongs to this state. So you classify that as belonging to the lower threshold voltage state, ER, in the previous case. And if you actually know that, well, after all of those read disturbs that you do, uh, the cells uh, that have less threshold voltage shifts are read disturb resistance, then you basically deem them as belonging to the higher threshold voltage state because they were susceptible. If you do this, now you actually reduce the error significantly. Of course, after you uh, offline do this, you basically we can actually we see that you can actually reduce the error count by six, 36 percent, and you can use the ECC to correct the remaining error. So you can actually put back your flash drive to be operational if you still trust it. Of course, after that point, but you can at least get your data out of it. So that's the idea over here. It's a probabilistic mechanism because it doesn't work, of course, and you basically probabilistically classify these cells. 
Okay, and if you really want to look at the data, this is the data uh, that you see uh, in the, in the uh, paper. And this is the paper if you're interested in looking at it. Okay, any questions? We made a lot of progress. We're still not uh, at the end yet. But this may be a good time to actually take a break. What do you think? Any thoughts? Okay, let's take a break. Let's, take, let's be back around 13 minutes later at, at 1.20. And then we'll continue. Okay, shall we get started? Looks like everybody's clustered on this side of the room. Is that the locality principle? We come from here and then <laughs> you're the more random access people. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to continue. Uh, this is actually the first time I'm uh, really uh, treating flash memory as a full-blown full uh, lecture material, so you guys are lucky. This is really fun, I think, and there's a lot more to do in this area. Uh, I'm going to cover as much as possible, but we're not going to cover everything, of, of, of course. So we'll continue with the retention errors, because retention errors are actually still problematic, even after you do a lot of refresh. Uh, some of the techniques that we're going to discuss are going to have similarities to other works, as you will see. And hopefully by now you will know uh, some of the interesting things that are done in flash controllers. So retention errors are interesting because uh, basically this is what we wanted to do. Uh, these are some presentation slides from the Flash Memory Summit uh, where you present pretty often every year, basically. So basically we want to understand the retention loss in real NAND chips uh, and optimize and recover, basically. This is essentially what you do in flash uh, devices. I like this slide because for different types of errors, a flash device characterizes, optimizes, and recovers. Recovery doesn't always work on online. It's sometimes offline. Uh, but optimization is very, very important. Uh, so we're going to especially look at read performance for all, do all data over here, but relatively quickly. So this is one story that uh, this kind of story happens actually in flash device quite a bit. Uh, Basically, uh, device performance degrades over time. By now, based on what you learned, this is not a surprise to you, right? Over time, you get more refresh, you try more of these error correction mechanisms, neighbor assist correction. As a result, your latency should increase over time, and your energy consumption should also increase. But there are some cases where things sometimes hit the news. I don't know whatever news this is over here, but basically, people talk about read performance degradation when the device gets older. Uh, and as you can see, reading old files is consistently slower than normal, as slow as, well, it's actually really slow, 30 megabytes per second, uh, whereas newly written files uh, are much faster, as you can see, right? Some, some important SSD of its time, uh, probably from, 19, uh, from, from 2014, 2015 or so. Okay, so these things happen, basically. These things happen because flash controllers actually optimize over time, and as a result, they, they may become slower. Hopefully, they don't become as slow as uh, 30 megabytes per second in terms of bandwidth. But they do. And it's very fundamental. <laughs> Basically, all data is slower because they have retention loss. This is nice slides from my student, Yishin, whose, whose thesis was on flash memory, basically. <laughs> I like the analogy here. <laughs> Okay, uh, so basically I've charged leakage over time and we know this, right? At some point you get a retention error uh, because you're depleted of charge and you get actually wrong, uh, your read reference voltage basically doesn't uh, give you the right value. And we know that this is one dominant source of flash memory errors. Uh, and one side effect is you get longer read latency because you adjust uh, the threshold voltage to the shifts in the read reference voltage, uh, shifts in the threshold voltage distribution. Okay, we know all of this. I'm going to go through this really quickly, basically. Uh, yeah. And we can characterize it, as you know. So this is what happens. This, is, this shows the shifts in the threshold voltage distribution. So zero day, meaning uh, you programmed something, and at that point, you measure the threshold voltage distribution. It looks like this blue curve over here. After 40 days, that curve is the black curve. And this is still in a good device. If you actually keep going longer, you, the threshold voltage distribution shifts even more. Basically, the threshold voltage distribution, distribution shifts to the left and also widens because of retention loss. You're losing charge. As a result, your threshold voltage reduces, which makes sense. Okay. And basically, this is what happens, as we've seen before also. 
So at some point, your Robit errors become greater than the ECC correctable errors. At that, at that point, uh, you actually uh, do something else, perhaps. This is what used to happen, actually, in the past. In the past, flash controllers were less proactive in terms of uh, read or try. Basically, your, your Robit errors are greater than e error correct uh, ECC correctable errors. At that point, either your flash stops, uh, the flash drive is dead, or you adjust your read reference voltage. Today, everything is more proactive. Basically, you try to predict your read reference voltage, as we know. So basically, you, if you actually predict your read reference voltage, uh, you hopefully shift it earlier. But assume that you didn't predict it well enough. Uh, you need to somehow increase your read latency. Right? Basically, if you're, if you're in, a, in a really old device and you get these robot errors that are greater than ECC correctable errors, one of the first options for you to try is really uh, to increase the read latency. Uh, not increase the read latency, but change your read reference voltage at that point in time. Now, this is the downside of changing your read reference voltage after, at the point you're really trying to read it. That's why people have developed a lot of techniques to predict the read reference voltage before you really need to change it. Uh, adjust your read reference voltage in a proactive manner. If you do it in a reactive manner, you increase your read latency at the critical path because you get these errors, you cannot correct them. At that point, let's find out our read reference voltage that works. That increased the read latency, and that's why you saw the news over there earlier. That's not a good approach. That's why we developed a lot of these proactive techniques. OK, but at some point, you may need to do this. You still increase your read latency because your prediction may not be correct, and uh, your errors may be too much also. right? So you basically want to try a good read reference voltage. And this, as we know it, this is read retry. You basically change the read reference voltage, retry. If ECC passes, that's good. If ECC doesn't pass, you change the read reference voltage again and try. OK. So basically, that's what happens. Uh, you, uh, over time, you, you leak charge. This generates retention errors. Even if, you, even if you do refresh, this requires read retry, and you get longer read rate latency. So the ideal read voltage, as we know, is some, uh, basically the voltage that crosses these distributions over here. That leads to the minimal read latency. Uh, so in reality, this op changes over time due to retention loss. Uh, luckily, you can actually model this also. So we're going to basically model this. Uh, this, uh, this OPT, or uh, optimal read reference voltage change, is gradual and unidirectional. It, it, uh, it decreases over time. So if you want to adapt it to the read uh, uh, re retention errors, you can actually build a model for this. So the, the, the idea is very simple. Again, it's very similar to what we did with read disturb. But these are different components. Read disturb is a different type of error. Retention is a different type of error. Eventually, you need to build a model that encompasses all of those. And existing flash controllers actually do that. So one component is you online pre-optimize. Uh, pre you learn and record this optimal read reference voltage as much as possible. And you do this in the background once every day. So now you see that pattern, right? For these different areas, you do some uh, background characterization once every day and predict what your voltage will be. And uh, if your recorded uh, optimal voltage is out of date, meaning that you use this read reference voltage, but you still get uh, errors, that are not correctable, then you do a read try with a lower voltage. That's the idea. So what is the online pre-optimization algorithm? It's very similar again. It's triggered periodically. You find and record an optimal read reference voltage uh, as a prediction uh, per block basis. So basically, how do you find it? You actually do this characterization once in a while. Let's assume that this is your old read reference voltage. You basically find a new read reference voltage based on uh, the characterization of the distribution you do perform it in the background. So you get a small storage overhead, which is in the paper. It's similar to the read disturb uh, mechanism. And if you want to improve the read to try, now uh, you use this predicted read reference voltage. And this predicted read reference voltage is ho hopefully already close to the real optimal. Right? Real optimal is really what you need at that point in time to minimize the errors. So if ECC fails, uh, you decrease uh, the read reference voltage and then re retry. So hopefully now you don't do it. Uh, you don't do a lot of iterations in this read or try. Right? That's the idea. That's why you need to model this uh, predicted uh, voltage. Okay. So if you want to look at it, you see actually a lot of benefits from these techniques. You can reduce the read or try count by about 30% if you do this uh, modeling, and you reduce the decode ECC latency. You can optimize that also actually decoding latency, and you can actually to reduce the total read latency significantly as well. Uh, Actually, this is normalized, so it's really 29% uh, um, of what it was before, because you get rid of a lot of reader tries. 
Read retry means, what does it mean? You read a page. Uh, if you want to read it with a separate set of read reference voltages, you read it again. It's basically doubling your latency if you do it twice. Basically, it's linear with the number of times you re retry. That's why this reduction is very large. It's 70% reduction over here. This is normalized. And this is also 70% reduction in the read retry count. So, and it directly affects your latency, basically, as you can see, how many times you do the read retry. You don't want to do read retry that much. That's why we don't want to do neighbor-assisted correction that much also. OK. So that's the idea, and we've already discussed this uh, over here, I think. Yeah, you basically learn uh, the optimal read reference voltage periodically, and then if, if, even if it's out of date, you minimize the read to try uh, and the robot error rate. Okay, we're going to look at another example over here. So if you, are, if you know your cells really well, you can actually recover the data after failure too. This is very, going to be very similar to the read disturb prone, read disturb resistant cells. Similar to read disturb proneness, you have uh, retention prone and retention resistant cells uh, also. So we've already seen this. So, okay. Basically, there are some cells that are fast leaking and there are some cells that are slow leaking uh, if they are subject to the same amount of time where they're not touched. And we can use this in a very similar way as we discussed earlier. So this go these slides are going to be very similar to the read disturb uh, uh, recovery technique. Right? If you look at these two distributions, P2 and P3, they consist of heterogeneous composition of slow leaking and fast leaking cells. Now, if you look at very old data, these distributions shift, and these cells get mixed, as you can see. Right? So as a result, this fast leaking cell, if you use the optimal read reference voltage here, this fast leaking cell that originally belonged to this distribution, P3, now is read as belonging to P2. And this slow leaking cell that originally belonged to P2 now is read as belonging to P3. Even if you use the optimal read reference voltage, even if you use all of the best read retry technique, you cannot fix this because you're really using the optimal read reference voltage at that point in time. So you need to use more information. What is that more information? That's exactly what I said, which is the fact that the cell is fast leaking and the cell is slow leaking. So your drive again fails because uh, you have an uncorrectable error, what do you do? Well, you keep it around for a while. Uh, basically, you, read, uh, you record what you've read, uh, and, and uh, the drive has failed because of a particular read, clearly. You record what you've read. Let's say you wait, I don't know, 100 more days, and then you figure out which cells are fast leaking and slow leaking, and then you do a statistical analysis saying, okay, this, this cell was fast leaking, so I misread it. I'm going to, I'm going to say that this is actually uh, belonging to P3. And then you apply ECC again, and if it passes, now you recovered your data. Of course, the downside is you need to wait 100 days after your drive fails. But of course, you could do it after 10 days, 20 days. 100 days, you don't need to wait, I think. You can, you can, you can adjust that length. So that's the idea, basically. I already said this. Slow leaking cells have higher threshold voltage distribution. So there are some risky cells, as you can see, that fall into this vicinity where you get uncorrectable errors. Uh, and basically, this explains it. If, you actually, if, you're in a, if you're a risky cell, and if you're slow leaking, you should really be characterized as belonging to a P2. If you're in the risky area, and if you're fast leaking, you should really be characterized as belonging to a P3. That's the idea. So how do you know whether it's fast leaking and slow leaking? Basically, you wait for a while and then do that. That's the fun way of doing it. <laughs> of course, that's, that's not what happens. So basically, you guess the original state of the cell from its leakage speed property. You identify the risky cells. You identify fast, slow leaking cells, and guess the original state, and use that key formula. Uh, basically, this is what we did uh, for the particular evaluation that we did. This is one way of doing it. Let's assume that you program with random data. After 28 days, you detect some failure because uh, ECC is not able to correct. You back up the data, and you wait for uh, 12 additional days, and then you can recover the data correctly. And this eliminates, say, a significant number of uh, robot errors, and ECC can correct the remaining errors. Of course, it's not an online mechanism, right? I mean, you could potentially do it online, but you really need to uh, know your access pattern extremely well. <laughs> or your access pattern needs to allow you to wait for 12 additional days. I don't know which access patterns do that. OK, so that's the idea. Uh, and uh, you can read the paper for more detail. You get significant lower shorter read latency with the original uh, retention optimized reading technique, and you get you can recover data after failure uh, if you know your cells well. And that's the paper. 
Any questions? Okay. Okay. So I've snuck in the large-scale field analysis here very quickly. I'm going to talk about that. So we've been talking about very small-scale analyses right now, right? These are understanding your device. It's always good to know your large-scale field analysis also, and I'm going to give you an example. But we're not going to go into the detail of this that much. You should read the paper for more detail. So basically what we did was uh, we did the study with Facebook. Facebook, uh, actually a lot of the data center companies now use SSDs very heavily uh, in, their, in their systems. Uh, and other people have done studies with uh, Google and Microsoft uh, flash memories as well. So if you, these are correlational studies. You basically look at a very large number of devices and look at the error rates that you get in the field. So we cannot report the number of devices, but it's a lot. Uh, it's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe larger, <laughs> actually larger. <laughs> But basically, this is the distribution that you get uh, in the error rate of the device. It's very interesting. This shows that some devices fail a lot more than others. So there is a distribution variation across the devices also. As expected, we've seen this variation in DRAM right, in the past. Um, and this follows a Pareto distribution. You can read the paper. So you could potentially make use of this data for uh, predictive reasons also. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that. But some of the things that we've examined is this. We looked at read disturbance, temperature effects, access pattern effects. Life cycle, how, how, do, how do different SSDs behave? I'm not going to go through this in detail. You can read the paper. Uh, but uh, there's an early detection life cycle period, which I'm going to briefly talk about. So do you guys know about the best bathtub curve? This is very common. This is a fundamental curve. Oh, you know about it. OK. In reliability, basically. It's not really related to electronics even. Any kind of part has this kind of lifetime pattern. This is when the part. Uh, is manufactured and the first time you use it. And over time, as it gets used, the failure rate looks like this. If you look at a large number of parts. So initially, the probability of failure or the failure rate across a large number of devices is very high. And then, uh, this, this is called the infancy period. And then you become more mature, you don't fail as much. And then you become older and you become uh, you fail. So this is the wear out period, infancy, normal lifetime, and wear out. And that's very fundamental to many, many devices. People have done studies with cars, for example. Cars, when they're for both, uh, first bought, uh, their failure rate is high because they're not tested. These are the ones that may not have been tested just enough, right? They fail very quickly, and the ones that survive are going to survive for a long time. It's actually a property of this Pareto distribution. Uh, if you if you, if you survive long enough, the probability that you're going to survive longer is high. If you haven't survived enough, the probability that you're going to survive is not as high. That's called decreasing hazard rate. There's distributions with decreasing hazard rate that have that kind of property. If you've survived, your hazard rate decreases. <laughs> That's the idea. And this is actually, uh, basically, this is a fundamental reliability curve. You have this bad top curve. <laughs> So we see somewhat this bad top curve in the SSD distributions that we study. Uh, well, this is the early failure period, useful life period, and wear out period. Uh, but it's a bit different, uh, because part of the reason is we use a different metric. We use a time uh, independent utilization metric, uh, which is the number of uh, times you've written to the SSD. So this is what we see, basically. This is the data written, and this is the failure rate. And we need to do the study actually more right now. Basically, we see. Uh, somewhat like the wear out, wear out curve like this. You have the wear out period, you have the useful life period, you have the early life failure period. Uh, but there's also this other early detection period that looks like this. Initially, you have a smaller uh, error rate. But maybe that's too early in the lifetime to see this. I don't know. But you can, you can, you can read this in the paper in more detail. Uh, there, there's, some, there's some potential analysis in the paper that says maybe there are two types of distributions over here. Uh, some devices actually uh, fail, uh, are, are in the failing mode in this, at this point in time. Okay, so temperature is very interesting also. So we, this is again a correlational study. Uh, if you look at uh, an SSD, there are temperature sensors over here. And we look at basically how those temperature sensors uh, correlate with the failure rate. And there are multiple different cases. So these are some SSDs where temperature positively correlates with the failure rate. Uh, in this case, as temperature increases, your failure rate also increases. Unco failure rate is uncorrectable error rate, basically. And you can read the paper for more detail as to exactly what this is. But it's correlated with your uncorrectable error rate. 
But there are some other SSDs uh, where uh, SSDs uh, throttle themselves or shut down themselves if uh, you have high temperature. And you get results that are temperature independent. So these are some other SSDs. You can see the uh, manufacturers, A, B, C, D, E, in the paper. Uh, I recently presented a paper, uh, and somebody said uh, we should be putting out these manufacturer names as opposed to ABCs over there. And my response was, well, if you work uh, hard enough, you can really figure out what those A, B, C, D is, first of all. Second, if you ask us, we can tell it. Uh, but putting out those names uh, is not very nice uh, in a paper, especially if you want to sustain a relationship with those manufacturers. And this is really important, actually. Uh, we would never be able to publish any of those flash papers if we insisted on putting out the manufacturer name out there. <laughs> it's... Yeah, I think sometimes people don't understand the difficulties uh, in, in putting out real data out into the field. Uh, so it's very important to actually anonymize these manufacturer names uh, when you put out real data. Uh, of course, in some cases we don't, right? Uh, uh, but th those cases are not as sensitive as some of the data that we put over here. Some of these failure rates that we put out in Flash, for example, directly go to the heart of the manufacturer's business because they actually, uh, these di directly affect their yield. If you look at performance data, of course, uh, performance data, okay, uh, it's everybody can measure, but some of this data is not really easy, uh, something that everybody can measure. Okay, but you can guess, actually. If, you're, if, you, if, you, if people do their homework a little bit, you can guess who ABC <laughs> is. <laughs> and in, in general, if you actually want to learn this information uh, for... Uh, uh, you, can, you can get that information from the authors by asking them privately, as opposed to asking them reporting, uh, to report this to the entire world. <laughs> okay, that's a side note, basically. <laughs> so these are manufacturers. You may not know what they are, but that's okay. I mean, actually, these, are, these may be the same manufacturer, but different types of generations of devices also. That's, so this is a more intelligent device, perhaps. It throttles itself. But of course, there's a downside. Once it throttles itself, it doesn't work as fast. Uh, and there's some analysis in the paper related to that also. So basically, the key takeaway is throttling the SSD usage actually helps mitigate temperature-induced errors. Thro what does throttling mean? Basically, you throttle the access rate. Sometimes you shut off, actually, SSD, which may not be really great for performance, but if you're operating at very high degrees of temperature, then uh, that may be the right thing to do, right, as opposed to getting these huge number of errors that you see over here. Okay. Okay, so uh, there are other uh, observations over here. Read disturbance is an important problem, as we discussed. But read disturbance errors actually don't, get, uh, if, don't affect the software because there are multiple reasons. One, says, one reason is flash memory actually uh, corrects a lot of these errors in the SSD. As a result, we do not actually see this. So this study is done at a high level, basically. You, we look at the software observable errors, meaning that these are the errors that are not corrected by the SSD, right? There, so there are multiple levels of error correction. So if you get error correction in the SSD, uh, okay, you may correct it. That's fine. It's handled internally there. But there may be some errors that are not corrected by the SSD that get reported to the operating system. Now, the operating system has measures for correcting those errors also, right? It could basically, it could have partitioned the data across different SSDs. For example, it could have a redundant array uh, of an expensive disk space on system where you actually have multiple copies of data in different parts of the SSD, and it could actually try to resolve the error using those techniques. So these are the errors that are reported by the SSD that may be potentially resolvable by the operating system. Okay, read disturbance doesn't make its way up to the uh, operating system basically as much. Okay, temperature we already discussed, I think. And there, there's also... Uh, well, there also uh, SSD also has page caching, right? Inside the D, uh, there, there is DRAM inside the SSD today, as we've discussed in the past, and there, they, it employs page caching, uh, and it also employs over provisioning uh, to handle the writes in different ways. And the paper actually uh, quantifies the effects of those, and you can read it for more detail. But I'm not going to go through this in detail. There are more studies to be done in this area. Uh, of course, these are also hard studies to do uh, for various reasons. One is Getting access to this data is not easy. Big companies have access to that data, but they don't necessarily collect all the data. Uh, so we were much more lucky with the DRAM uh, studies that we've done with Facebook, for example, because the data that's collected over there was much more comprehensive. The data that's collected over here was not so comprehensive. That's the first difficulty. The second difficulty is, uh, 
okay, you have access to data, let's say, uh, but you don't control the data. This is all a, per, a purely correlational study, right? So you cannot really draw very strong conclusions from these studies. You can say, okay, temperature correlates uh, with failure rate. That's good. <laughs> but you cannot, so correlation is not necessarily causation, although in temperature it's not bad. Maybe you can guess the reasons, but you cannot prove it, right? Whereas in the other studies that we've discussed, you can actually control only one variable, assuming you design the experiment right. Here, you're not designing an experiment. You're just observing what's happening in the field. And by nature, that's correlational. But it's, it's really important to do these studies also. And you can, uh, maybe some of you will, be, will do that. And there, there needs to be more of these studies, I think. Uh, we have these huge scale cent data centers in the world. And there's a lot of data to be collected, to be understood. I think there, the, the number of people who are doing these studies are, uh, is, is, is too small compared to the amount of data that we actually have about these machines. OK. OK, I don't know what this is. So there are some other works that I'm not going to cover. This is actually interesting. This basically talks about some potential vulnerabilities uh, in NAND flash memory and potentially exploiting it for security uh, attacks. This is not easy, I think. Uh, again, it's not easy because flash memory is not directly exposed to your programming language, right? You go through layers of operating system, file system calls, and then even after that, uh, there's a controller sitting in between uh, those requests that is coming from uh, uh, the system and how it handles those requests, right? So how do you actually bypass all of those to induce attacks? It's not easy, I think. But there, there's some vulnerability here. And this actually, this paper looks at the reliability as well as security issues of memory uh, programming mechanisms. If you remember, we have uh, 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 different kind of programming mechanisms. If you want to program a multi-level cell, you do two-step programming, right? And that two-step programming actually leads to some vulnerabilities because you program some cells first, wait for a while, and then program some other cells. Okay, but if you want to learn about that, this is the paper to take a look at. And we've already discussed this one. Uh, now let's take a look at 3D NAND a little bit. Any questions so far? Do other people find this as fascinating as I find it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think it's really fascinating because I, emerging memory technologies are looking like this at some level. They're somewhere in between DRAM and flash. So if you look at emerging memory technologies like what we've discussed, phase change memory, there, there will be controllers that are doing some of this. And those controllers need to be even more uh, uh, careful than flash controllers, because the latencies of those memories are much lower than flash memory, yet you need to actually do a lot of error correction to make sure that they work also. And as a result, similar techniques are going to be employed in those controllers in a much more efficient manner. Okay, so let's talk about 3D NAND, uh, because so far, actually, all of the data that I presented is from 2D, planar NAND. And it's, it's very interesting still, and it's going to be even more interesting, especially when 3D NAND scales down to smaller uh, feature sizes. Uh, and at some point, flash manufacturers were actually very limited in terms of planar flash memory. And all of these error studies are extremely important, and they're still very important. But 3D NAND relaxed things a little bit and changed things a little bit. Uh, and we're going to talk about that. Because it enabled another level of freedom, which is the 3D stacking nature. And we've actually done some studies. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but this is one. Uh, Yishin's dissertation was actually on both planar as well as 3D NAND, but his latest contributions were on 3D NAND. Uh, both error modeling as well as mechanisms to uh, reduce errors, uh, improve reliability. I'm going to talk about this one uh, in a little bit. Uh, okay, so basically we have this lifetime problem. I think we see this before. Uh, generation N looks like this, and this is an example. Robit error rate curve looks like this, and you have to achieve some. Uh, you have some ECC that achieves some lifetime, right? And if you go to generation M plus one, even though you may actually increase your ECC capability, your lifetime becomes lower because this is much less reliable, right? I've shown this in a much different way earlier when we first started the flash memory lectures, but this is really the fundamental problem. You move from one generation to another generation, even though you may actually have increased ECC capability, you actually get less lifetime. And I've shown you the, the numbers for this uh, very early on in the previous lecture, lecture 14b. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So basically, uh, 
And that's exactly what was happening with planar NAND flash memory. Uh, and that's exactly what the scaling problem was. Uh, and P uh, manufacturers reduced the flash cell size, reduced the distance between cells, and tried to have more multi-level cells to increase capacity. But this actually led to reliability problems. In 3D NAND, you could do all of those, but you also have uh, another level, uh, layer, uh, level of freedom, which is you can add more layers on top of it, on, on top. So you actually have this three-dimensional structure, which we will see. So if in planar NAND, scaling actually hurts reliability, scaling uh, the, the cell size, reducing the distance, and also reducing the uh, uh, chopping up the threshold voltage distribution to finer pieces to store more bits. They all hurt reliability, and we've studied that a lot. Now, this is not well studied, and we're, we're going to change that now when we discuss this. So all of these that we discuss is applicable over here, but there's more. Now, the upside here is, what did, what did the manufacturers do? Uh, this level of freedom provided them a, a breathing space, if you will. Now they're operating in that breathing space, where they don't need to reduce the flash cell size as much. Now they actually increase the flash cell size. So here it was about 15 nanometers, let's say. Now it's about 40 nanometers. They increased it, but they were able to put more stuff, uh, have, have higher capacity by having more layers like this. So that enabled uh, uh, improved reliability in some aspects, because you don't have some of these problems uh, at higher capacity. But that's a one-time jump. You move from 3D, 2D technology to 3D technology. Now 3D technology, as it scales, it's going to have problems. One is, uh, how does it scale? You increase the number of layers. That leads to some problems, as we will see. Uh, or you actually do very similar techniques which all of those need to be done if we keep, want to keep increasing the capacities. And as a result, we will see that 3D NAND flash memory is going to become even more complex than planar NAND, because it's going to have all of these issues that we discussed, plus issues caused by 3D. Okay, but it's still a good technology. I mean, it's, good, it's a good move from one technology to another, uh, but it's going to be more complex down the road. So this is, uh, we've seen this before, but this is uh, the charge trap transistor. It's a 3D structure. Uh, you have this con control gate that wraps around uh, this uh, uh, layer over here, and charge gets trapped inside an, uh, over here in an insulator, and you have the substrate and the source and drain. Now you can see that you can stack these transistors on top of each other, right? And that's essentially what people do. Well, just to contrast, this was a 2D floating gate cell. There is a 3D charge trap cell. Uh, it turns out actually you have less charge over here. Uh, uh, 3D cells actually can be floating gate also, but they're uh, not as well studied so far. So floating gate is not, uh, whether you have floating gate or charge trap is actually independent of 3, 2D or 3D, but it turns out charge trap is easier to manufacture in 3D, and floating gate is a bit harder uh, in 3D right now. But take that with a grain of salt, that's going to change. But this is what the structure, this is the fundamental structure of the charge trap cell, and you basically string together many of these charge trap cells in a 3D manner. This is what uh, the 3D structure looks like. You have these bit lines, 3D, uh, and then you have these word lines. Word lines are within a layer. Uh, bit lines cross across the layers, as you can see. And a block is still the same as what we discussed before. It's bit line, word line. But a block now spans multiple layers, as you can see. Right. Does that make sense? And you have another block over here, another block over here that is completely separate. Good? Okay. Is there anything else that I want to say over here? I guess not. And then you, of course, have the sense amplifiers and everything else that is not drawn here. Uh, okay. So, I mean, there's more detail over here, but you can read this paper for some more detail. So, now let's take a look at the comparison of some of these errors uh, that we have, that we've studied. Uh, so, uh, P program array cycling, I'm not going to go into the detail, but this is discussed in that paper, this paper that I mentioned over here. Uh, but programming recycling, uh, it turns out, this, this is wear out, 3D cells are less susceptible because charge trap transistors that are large are good for now. So this is not as big of a problem at the moment. But as the cell size scales down, this is going to be a bigger problem, as we discussed. Program errors, program interference errors, basically 3D is less susceptible again for now because, because the cell size is large, they use one-shot programming 
they don't do this two-step programming that's really needed as the cell size becomes smaller. And as a result, uh, this is also less susceptible. Cell-to-cell -cell interference is also less of an issue in 3D because uh, you have a larger manufacturing process technology. As I said, it's 35 to 40 nanometers as opposed to 15 nanometers, let's say, 10 to 20. Data retention is actually a bigger issue, it turns out. Uh, 3D is more susceptible in this case because you have this early retention loss problem. Whenever you uh, program, after you program, you quickly lose data. So you need to have solutions to this. So retention loss, longer time retention loss is a problem in planar, but early retention loss is a big problem actually in 3D. And read disturb again, it's less susceptible because of the larger manufacturing process technology. So this is the breathing room that you see, right? The manufacturer has got a breathing room because they were able to actually invent a new technology where they could manufacture much better. A lot of the error characteristics are better, but some of them are worse. But now if you go down, if you scale everything to a very smaller uh, uh, sizes, all of these areas are going to become more important again. So I'm going to go over one paper very quickly uh, just to give you a flavor of what are the things that, that are slightly different in 3D. I'm not going to cover the things that are similar. Basically, the motivation is clear, right? 3D NAND error characters are not well studied. Actually, these two papers that I just mentioned earlier are the, are the only two areas that are with real 3D NAND flash devices that give you comprehensive data. Uh, so we wanted to understand and mitigate 3D NAND errors to improve lifetime. Uh, so basically, understanding requires characterization. So it turns out there are some conclusions over here. One is uh, very interesting. You basically have huge effect of process variation across these different layers. So there is uh, basically more than one order of magnitude error rate difference between layers. Some layers that are in the middle actually have very high error rates for various reasons. Uh, so that's one problem. Uh, early retention loss is another problem. Error rate actually increases by 10x after three hours, three hours after programming. And this is much higher than actually uh, planar. Uh, and there's also retention interference, which I'm not going to cover that much. It's not observed before in planar NAND. Basically, you, uh, you have this retention loss interference problem that you can read in the paper. Uh, so, okay. So if you actually know this, you can actually apply similar techniques. You can model the orbit error rate and threshold voltage. Uh, so this paper develops a robot error rate variation model and a retention loss model for 3D NAND flash. But I'm not going to go cover that in a lot of detail. It's, the principles are relatively similar. Um, it's a bit more complex uh, in 3D. And also, how do you mitigate 3D NAND flash errors after that? So if you know that process variation is a problem, well, why don't you pick the different redreference voltages for different layers? If, you, if, if your layers require, have different threshold voltage distributions, it makes sense to have different uh, uh, redreference voltages for different layers. And that's the idea over here. And also, if, you're, if your layers are actually very disparate from each other in terms of error rates, uh, maybe you actually do better interleaving of your rate uh, such that you, you pick blocks uh, uh, in, a, in a more uh, mm, balanced fashion. And I'm going to talk about that briefly. And also there is retention model that we're reading that basically adapts the redreference voltage to the retention, predicted retention. And actually, if you do all of this, uh, you, you can improve uh, 3D flash lifetime by about 2x, 1.85x, or keep the flash memory lifetime and reduce the error correction code overhead by about 80% in this case. Again, you can, you can play different tricks, right, depending on what you want to do. So let's take a look at this uh, very quickly. Uh, I'm going to focus on the interesting characterizations. Basically, this is another look at the 3D chip, right? I didn't show it exactly like this before, but it actually looks like this. Uh, you have these different layers, and this is one word line, this is another word line, and this is the bit line, as you can see. And this is one block over here. This is another set of blocks over here. This third one is another, fourth one is another one. And that's a flash cell as we know. So basically, uh, these may have different error characteristics, and they do have different error characteristics depending on which layer uh, you're at. And we did have some characterization methodologies that you can read in the paper. So this is the layer number, normalized, uh, and this is uh, the orbit error rate. And these are MSP and LSP pages. You see that there's a huge variation uh, across the layers. The lowest layers are actually the ones that are in the uh, lower uh, bottom part. And the ones that are in the middle are actually susceptible to more, layer, uh, 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 more errors. Well, part of the reason is you're sandwiched in between, right? You really uh, have a lot of effects going on uh, because you're, um, you're, you're really affected by many layers if you're somewhere in between. 
And that's one of the explanations over here. Of course, there needs to be more characterization and understanding to, be, to, to understand this. But this is a real effect. It's measured across many chips. You, you have a significantly higher error rate in the middle of the stack. Does that make sense? OK. OK, and MSP and LSP has a difference also, but you can read the paper for that. Mm. And that's the maximum robot error rate happens in these layers uh, in the middle. And other chips uh, see similar trends. OK. So there's a retention loss phenomenon also. Uh, you basically uh, lose charge. Uh, except in planar NAND, this happens to be a much slower process, whereas here, it happens to be a much faster process due to the properties of this charge trap. Uh, it happens to uh, be very quick. So you quickly lose data. Uh, so this is an example of this. This is the robot error rate uh, that you get, and this is the retention time. As you can see, this is a much slower process in planar, and this is much faster in 3D. Basically, if you, have, if you want to have three uh, hours retention time, you get 10x more errors compared to the base over there. And you get 10x more errors if you want to have 11 days more retention time. And you get 10x more errors after, if you want to have three years more retention time. So you get a lot of errors, basically. But here, it's actually a lot, early retention loss. That's why this is called early retention loss phenomenon. You, you accumulate 10x more errors very quickly in the very beginning, right after programming. OK. So how do you, uh, OK, I'm going to. And also, uh, there's another thing. Amount, amount of retention losses correlated with neighbor cell states. Uh, I mean, that's actually true for planar NAND, but it's actually much, a much bigger effect uh, on 3D NAND. Uh, so you need new mechanisms to, take, uh, to tolerate these different observations that we've just discussed. And there's more detail in the paper that you can take a look. Uh, so how do you actually develop new mechanisms? Well, we're going to develop new models. Uh, we're going to model the threshold voltage distribution uh, of 3D NAND. And we're going to try to predict the redress and voltages, just like we did. Uh, and we want to actually predict the robot error rate as well. So there's a robot error rate model in the paper. And I mean, these fundamentals don't change between 3D NAND and uh, 2D NAND. You still have this sort of distribution, except that distribution varies across layers, right? And we want to do the same thing that we've done before. We want to predict these uh, voltages. Uh, so this is the retention loss model. Uh, you can actually model the early retention loss as a simple linear function of log retention time. You can read the paper. I believe this is going to get more complicated as cells become smaller. So take all of these with a grain of salt. Your flash controllers need to adapt to the technology that they're, they actually uh, are built for. Okay. And actually, I'm going to skip a lot of this because this is basically the model, the optimal uh, uh, voltage prediction model. And you can see that there are a bunch of functions over here, uh, like program array, cycle count, retention time, and some parameters that are learned uh, using regression. Right. OK, and the model there is actually pretty good. Uh, but you can read the paper for more detail. So if you actually have a model like this, uh, you can predict the per page robot error rate. Uh, and you can see that the, this is the model. Uh, well, this is the fit over here. It's a gamma distribution. And this is the fit uh, for variation agnostic VOPT. So basically, their, uh, variation agnostic VOPT uses the same redreference voltage for all layers, optimized for the entire block. But uh, it's much better to use this one, because uh, each layer has actually a different threshold voltage distribution. So you actually want to have a different uh, redreference voltage optimized for each layer. And you get better, perform, uh, better, uh, better performance in terms of reliability if you do that. OK, so there's modeling. OK, we already said this. We, I already said this also. You adjust the redreference voltage for each layer. Uh, and you basically learn a voltage offset for each layer. That's the idea over here. And uh, you can, re again, read, the, uh, read it in more detail. But you learn it once for each chip and store in a table uh, that offset. And you can predict uh, the layer agnostic VOPT using existing models that we've discussed earlier. And this actually, if you do this, if you actually do this layer to layer, layer aware uh, reading, you, you get rid of a lot of robot errors. So it has a big effect, as expected, because there's a huge variation right, between different layers in terms of error rate. OK, so this is another idea over here. Again, I'm going to go through these very quickly. Uh, we don't have time to cover rate, but. Uh, Essentially, uh, you have worst case uh, 
row bit error rate that's much higher than average row bit error rate because of the layer to layer process variation. We want to significantly reduce worst case row bit error rate. Uh, and the key idea over here is you want to group flash pages on less reliable layers with pages on more reliable layers. So what is, what is the idea of grouping? Uh, grouping is uh, if, you, uh, if you actually group multiple ch pages together, if, uh, if you get an error, you can actually reconstruct uh, what the page looks like uh, based on the grouping that you did. Let's assume that you have, uh, I don't know, five pages grouped together. You store those five pages and the XOR of all of those pages in some other location. If one of those pages fail, you can construct uh, that page using the remaining pages plus the XOR over the pages. XOR is just one function that enables reversibility. Right? That's the idea. By adding some redundancy, we will store one more page that's encoded based on all of these other pages. And if you lose one of them, you could reconstruct that using that encoding. And a lot of RAID mechanisms work this way. It's called redundant array of inexpensive disks. Basically, uh, it's developed for disks initially. You can store a page on multiple disks, uh, and actually, you, uh, well, multiple pages on multiple disks, and actually have re some redundancy. And that redundancy enables you to reconstruct some of the pages if you lose one of them. Uh, it, it enables you to, you to reconstruct n number of pages if you lose m number of them in the most general form. I gave you an example of, uh, when you lose, uh, when you actually ca cannot read one of them correctly, you can reconstruct it from five of them, uh, with four of the other ones. So this works nicely uh, if uh, your error distribution actually uh, minimizes your worst case raw bit error rate. So let's take a look at uh, the grouping that you potentially do. So these are different chips, and these are different pages, uh, and these are different word lines. Word lines are on different layers. And different layers have different characteristics. So if you actually group pages uh, of the same layer together in the same RAID group, uh, this may have a very high robot error rate. So all of them actually may fail at the same time. Right? So if this one fails, this one also may fail, this one also may fail, this one also may fail. So if you group them together and extort them or did something to them, added some redundancy, the probability that you're going to correct this is going to be much lower because all of them have very high failure rates, error rates. So the idea over here is to do the grouping. Well, I guess I picked that one because. Uh, so worst case arbor in any layer limits the lifetime of conventional RAID mechanism. I, I call it RAID, but it's actually applicable to any kind of error correction mechanism. If you group thing, these things together and apply an error correcting code on top of that, if you have lots of errors, as a result of your grouping, then the probability that your error correcting code is going to be successful is going to be low. Right? So you really want to group things uh, where you will have less number of errors. And that's the idea over here. You form your groups this way. Make sense? <laughs> what does this do? This basically distributes the highest number of uh, the word line that has the highest number of errors across different groups. And this enables you to hopefully uh, minimize, uh, the, uh, maximize the probability that you will be able to correct an error if you, uh, if you, get, a, uh, if you, if you get one failure, if you get some number of errors. So that's the idea over here. Uh, so when you're actually reading uh, these, uh, this group, uh, if you get an error, you can reconstruct it using these groups. That's the idea. Uh, now, the one problem is, of course, uh, you need to read different word lines now, right? if you get an error. You get an error in this particular uh, page that you're reading. Uh, you need to read these three to reconstruct what this looks like. As a result, you need to do one, two, three reads. Whereas here, it was much nicer. You get an error over here. You already have read probably all of this. Or, it, or you can read it uh, depending on how your data layout is. Okay. So there is a downside to it, but the upside is you can actually get significant error reduction. Um, and you can read the paper for the blanks, uh, so you lose some space in this case. But that may be OK. OK, so this gives you uh, the space loss is about uh, relatively small. And you can reduce, reduce the worst case uh, raw bit error rate significantly in this case, because you actually distribute this worst case across uh, these rate groups. 
Does that make sense? Okay, cool. Uh, so uh, this is one last thing. Uh, basically, uh, we said that threshold voltage shifts quickly after programming. That's early retention loss. And we want to adjust read reference voltages based on retention loss. And that's essentially what we do over here. You learn and use a retention loss model online. And this is similar to what we've discussed earlier with data retention aware uh, reading. Uh, and we, we try to predict again the VOPT using the model. So the benefit is again significant because retention is a very big problem in, in 3D and, and flash. You, you get significant reduction on robot error rate in this case. And as a result, uh, you improve the lifetime quite a bit. So let's take a look at this example again. Uh, this is the worst case robot error rate that limits your error correction. Uh, what, what, your error uh, what lifetime your error correction capability buys for you. And this is the baseline. And that's the state of the art mechanisms, if you use a lot of the mechanisms that we applied for uh, NAND flash. And if you actually use layer variation of air reading, uh, you get to the state of the art by itself without using all of those techniques. And if you actually uh, add this layer uh, independent rate, you do this. And if you actually use all of the techniques that are developed in the paper, the curve looks like this. That's the uh, robot error rate. As a result, you get a significantly longer lifetime. This should actually stop over here, but it's 85% longer lifetime for the given error correction capability. So if you actually don't want to change your lifetime uh, compared to this, ba uh, this blue baseline over here, you can reduce your ECC storage overhead significantly, as you can see, because now your EC if you want to remain at this lifetime, PE cycle count, then you, you, you need a much, uh, much weaker ECC which has much less storage cost, much less complexity. OK. OK. I think I've discussed everything over here. I'm not going to go through uh, this in detail. There's also some more things uh, here, uh, which basically adapts uh, neighbor-assisted correction uh, to uh, the retention interference. Basically, there's retention interference caused by neighbor cells, and that's a big issue in 3D uh, flash memory. You can change your neighbor-assisted correction mechanisms to take that into account. And you can imagine how you take that into account uh, a little bit. OK, so this conclusion I'm going to skip because we already covered all of that. But this is an example of uh, 3D NAND flash being different from planar flash. It's a little bit more complex, as you can see, because now the layers add more complexity. And understanding them is actually not that easy. Uh, and going forward, I think it's not just going to be the layers, but everything else as cells become smaller, layers become more, we're going to see more effects. So this is, uh, the flash scaling problem will not get easy going into the future because we don't have a fourth dimension to scale to, as far as I know, uh, at, least, at least physically. Or maybe, maybe some, of, some of you know how to scale to the fourth dimension. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, and if you're interested, you can read this paper. That's the, that's the state of the art, basically, in 3D NAND flash memory, along with the other paper uh, that I mentioned. OK, how are we doing on time? Good. 2.14. Any questions? You guys have been silent today. Either, I've, uh, either these are really fascinating, and you're just fascinating and fascinated on looking at it, or these are really boring. Which one? Take a vote. Who's fascinated by this? Okay, some people, <laughs> maybe. Yes. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, let's go back. That twenty-one X plot. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, uh, yeah, it's not perfect. <laughs> Basically, the manufacturing is not perfect, and there are heat issues also uh, that we don't fully understand or model. So my feeling is, uh, yeah, the, the higher layers, as you see, uh, well, the bottom layers uh, have somehow more heat because you cool from the top. All right, the bottom layer actually doesn't get cooled as much. As a result, I think there are heat effects that in addition to the interference effects, there are heat effects. And I think heat effects actually may be also maximum in the middle, right? Because things, get, things in game may get trapped. But modeling that, as far as I know, there are no good models for that. But that's a very good question, I think. Why is it not symmetric? Why? 
What else? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to discuss for every figure over here, actually. <laughs> and we don't know enough because this is new technology. Uh, there's more that needs to be done. And we don't even know enough about DRAM, right? <laughs> of how heat gets distributed across DRAM. That's... What else? Any other questions? So the paper has some more discussion, so if you're interested, take a look at it. Let me go and skip these very quickly because this is going to be too fast, uh, too slow with animation. Okay, I think this is much better. Okay, let's do this. So if there are no questions, I'm going to uh, move to the next thing. Okay, I'll give you one more idea before we are done with flash memory lectures. Uh, this is going to be similar to what we've discussed earlier. I alluded to it, actually, I gave the idea also. Uh, and this is uh, basically the idea of grouping different blocks uh, in different ways to fix the refresh problem. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've discussed the refresh is employed. Unfortunately, actually, refresh is not good. When you actually are toward the end of the lifetime, if you're really pushing the boundary, frequent refresh consumes the majority of the endurance improvement. <laughs> Meaning, you have some endurance improvement that you get from refresh, but if you're actually toward the end of your lifetime, you need to do a lot of refresh, and a lot of refresh causes a lot of remapping of the pages, of the same page. And that actually gets rid of some of your endurance improvement because when you remap, you're actually doing program and erase cycles. Right. So you actually put in refresh to improve your program and erase cycles, but you're taking away from some of your program and erase cycles because of refresh. So these work against each other. Well, refresh enables some program and erase cycles, but it also takes away. So how do you actually reduce the refresh overhead? Re reducing the refresh overhead becomes important here also, especially if you are toward the end of your lifetime in flash memory. And lifetime uh, is going to be even more important going into the future, especially as we improve the capacities. So basically, there are a bunch of observations that you can make. You can apply techniques like RADAR, like we discussed, retention aware intelligent DRAM refresh in Flash also. Uh, but one of the uh, examples is to take advantage of the access pattern. It turns out refresh is unnecessary for write hot data. Uh, and uh, the basic idea over here in this work is to physically partition write hot pages and write cold pages within the flash drive to different blocks, and then apply different policies to the, to the block. So if a block is write hot, you basically don't refresh that block as often. Maybe you don't refresh it at all, right? I don't know. Uh, and you could actually apply different policies. As we discussed again in the earlier flash lecture, I remember I drew this picture on the board uh, where you partition your drive into different types of blocks, and you can apply now different policies. You can apply different wear leveling policy, different garbage collection policy, because you have different write behavior. If, if some pages are not being written a lot, then you don't need to collect that garbage as much, right? Okay, so it turns out if you do something like this, you improve lifetime significantly, uh, and even if you do adaptive refresh on top of that, you basically get significant lifetime improvements uh, if you take a system that is already doing refresh and put this on top of that. Okay, basically, the key idea is, uh, okay, I'm going to skip this. This basically shows that you can read, write uh, on a page granularity, but you erase on a block granularity. Uh, in existing systems, you can do refresh on a block or page granularity, but this paper makes a case for doing this on a uh, block granularity. Today, what you do is you basically uh, allocate pages this way. You may have hot pages, cold pages that are mixed together, and as a result, if you want to refresh the block granularity, uh, you have to refresh everything, right? But if you actually do this, separate hot and cold pages with some prediction mechanism, then the key question is how do you predict what's hot and what's cold? Then read the paper. Uh, now you can actually do different things. Basically, you have these write hot blocks and other write hot blocks and write cold blocks. And you can relax the retention time for the write hot blocks. Again, this is a general concept. The idea is basically to separate uh, blocks or pages with different, uh, separate pages with different access patterns 
to separate parts of the drive. Access pattern may be uh, based on write hotness. How often do you write to this block? It could be based on read hotness also, right? How often do you read this block, right? If maybe you want to put uh, the blocks that you read a lot together, read hot versus read cold, right? Uh, if, you, if you do it together, then that leads to some potential benefits, but also that could lead to downsides. Right? Now you do a lot of read disturb on those blocks, right? So the key question is how do you balance these things? I'm not going to go into the detail, but there's a lot that goes on in a flash drive that looks like this today. And if you want to get a glimpse of it, this is, uh, this is the work that introduced the idea of write hot, write cold partitioning and saving the refresh uh, based on that. So now we're almost at the end of flash memory. Okay, uh, I'm not going to cover some of these works, as I said. You can read the vulnerabilities work over here. And if you really want to uh, get the entire summary, this is the paper to read. And actually, maybe I will assign this. It's a bit longer than the paper that you read, but uh, this is work that uh, we've actually written this paper for a year, more than a year or so. Uh, I was actually writing this last, uh, wait, wait a second, when was this published? 2017, now I remember. So we're in 2018 this year, right? Good. <laughs> During the Christmas and New Year's, uh, we actually did a lot of progress in writing of this paper last year. <laughs> Wait a second, that doesn't make sense. That must have been the previous year. <laughs> okay. It's amazing how years pass by. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, yeah, this, is, this was fun. Okay. And that's the end of the lecture for flash memory. And I, I think I'd like to take questions right now. Because I'm not sure if I want to start the next topic today. Any questions? We've covered a lot so far. You can ask questions about anything that we've covered. Flash memory is certainly fascinating. As I said, uh, this is going to be even more important when emerging technologies emerge. And some of them are really almost emerged like this 3DX point, right? And the, there are already SSDs, but there's going to be a memory 3DX point soon. And understanding those technologies and making use of them will be important. DRAM is important, as we know. Yes, one question. That's a, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, my feeling is yes, some of them, uh, certainly. But some of them are not applicable because the device doesn't operate that way. But some of them, I believe, uh, have yes. But there is not enough public information in that area, unfortunately. Yeah. For, for example, I'll give you an example that's more or less public. Basically, uh, wear leveling. These emerging technologies have an endurance problem similar to Flash. So they all need to do wear leveling internally. And some of the techniques uh, that have been inspired by Flash are used for PCM SSDs, for example. But of course, they're a little bit more efficient and slightly different. But refresh is another example. PCM is a retention loss phenomenon. There's some amount of refresh that goes on in those devices also. But there is more to come. <laughs> especially as these devices become uh, analyzed, uh, we'll understand them more. And yes? Exactly, yeah. So in PCM, it could move around also, yes. Uh -huh. It's, it's very hard to tell without public information, but with the endurance problem, you have a layer of remapping, potentially. Right? It, does, it does move around with wear leveling. But the mechanisms may be, in, in Flash, for example, you have this uh, mapping table, right? The DRAM is used as a mapping table. You get a lot, uh, as I discussed last time, you have a logical address coming in, and then you have a physical Flash address that's translated. That kind of access may be too much, too high overhead for PCM. Because in Flash, your access latency is very long anyway. What is another DRAM access before that? But in PCM, 
your access latency is closer to DM if you want to do another DM access before it. That's right, exactly, yeah. Exactly, yes. We, in, in that work, actually, we assumed there is very leveling, perfect very leveling. Even then, <laughs> uh, you didn't have a good lifetime, right? Yeah, yeah so there, there is some very leveling that is employed, and people have proposed it. Uh, I'd be happy to point you to some of them if you're interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the low latency is usually achieved by uh, arithmetically uh, determining the address you map to. So once in a while, you shift uh, the, the mapping that you have. Of course, this requires moving some blocks, but if you do it infrequently enough. In flash controllers, it's very uh, heavyweight because you basically have full flexibility as to where you map an address, right? That requires a full mapping table. But if you actually take an arithmetic function of the address and you shift that function uh, to uh, point to different locations once in a while, then you actually do the wear leveling uh, more, more efficiently. It's called start gap wear leveling. It was published in Micro in 2009. That's one example of a more efficient wear leveling technique. Yeah. These are very good questions. What else? More questions, comments, ideas? <laughs> oh, <laughs> our disk lecture. <laughs> you, prefer, you would like that? <laughs> or that's the natural progression, you think? No, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> I mean, those things are also fascinating, but... Uh, <laughs> It's good to know how things operate, for sure. Uh, you mean in, this, in the remaining part of the course? Uh, we'll talk about multi-core, uh, but we're not going to look into the hypervisor a lot. That's a bit... It should be covered in a more operating system course, but maybe in a future incarnation, yes. There's a, there's a lot, there are a lot of interesting things over there also, like scheduling and resource management. We're going to touch into resource management issues, but not as much from the hi hypervisor. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have much time. <laughs> and there are, there's a lot, there are a lot of fascinating things. I think I find hard disks very fascinating, for example. Yeah, the problem is uh, there should really be a storage systems class probably to teach it. Uh, I'm not sure if it exists. Probably not. Um, but also, I think uh, it's good to know, but the technology itself is not going to... <laughs> uh, like, uh, flash memory is actually a revolutionary technology, I think, uh, that's really dis displacing a lot of the hard disks quite a bit. Like, even in terms of reliability, flash memory is much better. Uh, people were... People didn't think that would be the case, but uh, compared to moving parts, mechanical parts, error rates that are seen in the field shows that uh, flash memory is a better option. But of course, cost-wise, uh, hard disks are, not, are hard to beat compared to flash memory. And the next lecture could be on tape. <laughs> I'm not sure if anybody teaches that actually at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, there, there are multiple. We've developed one which was published in FAST last year. But there's more to do, I think, especially, especially integrating that simulator with DRAM simulation is going to be very important, I think. And you could adapt that simulator to... Uh, simulate emerging technologies also, like phase change memory. I think there, that's a very good direction to study these effects.
Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> Protocol is always your limiter. So right now, a lot of the flash devices don't use SATA. It's more PCIe, a faster, higher bandwidth uh, protocol. Uh, but you can still find devices that use SATA, I think. Uh, but you're limited, basically. You can, you're limited as to what you can express, and you're limited as to what you can send back. Right? It'd be much nicer if, you're, if, if the whole system was integrated much closer to each other. That's right, yes. You're limited by the bandwidth over there. Device actually can have can be much more capable, potentially, in terms of latency, especially latency. But you have to go through this interface. That's very limited. And also, you cannot express much from that interface, right? If you're running an application, an application has some characteristics. Today, actually, people want to do that, but they're limited by that interface. For example, I, I want to say, OK, I access these pages very, very frequently. If I want to communicate that to the device, there is no way. It's all discovered today by the device somehow. Yeah, but that's a great question, I think. Those interfaces are some of the most limiting things that we have in systems today. The DRAM interface, the SSD interface. Yeah, you might want to try attaching a flash chip directly to your processor without the interface. But you need some sort of interface, of course. But, <laughs> but if you do that, then you get rid of a lot of that overhead that you have in the protocol. Yeah, there are three big limiters to innovation, I think, in research, or maybe in general. One is mindset. <laughs> if you don't have the right mindset, you limit your innovation to begin with. Uh, the second is interfaces. If you don't have the right interfaces, you limit the innovation because you partition things in the wrong way. I think the third one is reviewers. <laughs> <laughs> they limit innovation also by being unreasonable. <laughs> if you want to generalize that, I guess uh, people who are against innovation are the... Uh, that's, that's also about mindset, but mindset goes across, right? It's the researcher's mindset as well as the people's mindset. But interface is a big... Uh, in, my, in my opinion, interface are up there. It's a very hairy uh, place because... It's very hard to change some of these interfaces because there are a lot of players involved in it. Yeah, if you, if you have an evolving interface that's much more open, that could be a good way. Okay, any other questions? We had a, this is a good discussion. We should have more of that, I think. Anybody going once, twice? Should I go three times? <laughs> okay, so we'll continue tomorrow. Uh, I think we'll start with more multi-core uh, type issues tomorrow. So we're done with the memory system quite a bit, I think. Although we're going to talk about a lot of memory system issues in multi-core again. Uh, but we're not going to talk about uh, more memory devices. Okay, see you tomorrow.